military or the Navy has slowly been re relaxing the fishing restrictions. But it's very slow and a lot of restrictions in terms of what they can do. So there are a lot of female-headed households now in the Northeast because the men were all killed. Uh, and soldiers, they did not decrease the size of the army. In fact, they've been moved to increase. And the army is everywhere in the Northeast. They've gotten heavily involved, not just with demining, but they've set up commercial activities. They'll run food stalls. They'll sell. And they were, the government was saying, we need to get food to the people. So while the army's there, we'll have them sell the food. Uh, you know, that's it's not a great thing. It's like, yes, but the problem is if they're undercutting the prices, people are going back, who are trying to get reestablished with their living by selling food, and the army's food is cheaper, then everybody's going to buy from the army shop, and you'll go into business. Uh, the army is heavily involved with village decisions. If you want to hold a wedding, if you want to get a group of people together, you have to go ask the local commander for permission. Uh, you have, and women, particularly the female headed households, are very vulnerable. And there are a lot of reports coming out in the Northeast about rape, about sexual abuse, about women being you know, subject to soldiers coming by at night because they know who is where who is female and who isn't, and they know what's going on. And so there, it's a very, um, that population is very vulnerable. And it's not leading to reconciliation between the Tom and the Sinhalese communities. You have a defeated minority who is still very much defeated. You have a majority population that's still acting like, we won the war, we beat you. As opposed to, well, we're all Chinook and we have to figure out how to get along for going to share this island together. It hasn't yet happened that there's been a real move to reconciliation, which is very troubling if you fear that people who weren't killed, the younger people growing up who survived the final promise law, who saw their relatives being bombed, and the only killing them for their female relatives being raped or abused. But people aren't going away, and they're angry. And the last thing I would want is for Shalom to see violence. Uh, unless you provide a, a route toward reconciliation, unless you show people there's some justice, I'm afraid they have a lot of great risk of having a, another generation decide it's their time to pick up the gun. Uh, the current population is not about to do that. They tried that for 26 years and they lost. And everybody's very confused right now. I mean, that's my take on the current setup. But if this continues as it is, I'm afraid. Uh, this isn't really a blog question, so much a policy question per se is uh, Sri Lanka's government. But I was thinking more like uh, putting pressure on them, like going through the back door or the side door through like fair trade tea and getting in and trying to like negotiate with the farmers and then actually maybe getting their stories about what had happened just to kind of get the foot in the people to get put on the door because I know coffee is like something that's really kind of than uh, per se, like the, the new thing is fair trade coffee, but finding fair trade tea is a really hard thing. I know Ceylon mm -hmm. tea or Sri Lanka. Yeah, tea. they call it Ceylon tea, they, they market it on that. And um, I just wonder if there's something that Amnesty International has considered, perhaps is endorsing fair trade tea from Sri Lanka to try to get negotiations going and get people talking about what's going on over there. Amnesty has an interesting set of positions, it's not the best point when it comes to economic measures. Generally, the organization kind of shies away from them. We don't get into boycotts or uh, anything about trade generally, or haven't historically. Uh, we did make a big exception of conflict girls, the blood diamonds, the blood, the whole blood diamonds campaign for West Africa. We got behind that. It's an interesting idea. Uh, the tea, a lot of the tea plantations are in the south, and mm -hmm. in an area in, in the upper, in the highlands, up in the higher elevation where the, the weather is ideal for tea plants, that weren't part of the war. Really, I don't want to get into too much Sri Lankan history, but there's a whole other group of Tamils who are sometimes referred to as plantation Tamils, sometimes referred to as Indian Tamils, who are not the Sri Lankan Tamils. Shankar Tamils live in the northeast, although everybody now, a 
lot of them all over the place. It's about now. Uh, the plantation tunnels or Indian tunnels are, are a population that were brought over by the British in the 19th and 20th century to work what was first coffee plantations and then the coffee life and then to wipe out the coffee crop. They then all switched to tea in the late 19th century. And tea is one of their big products ever since. Uh, that, that group of tunnels haven't been politically active with the, they have their own Ceylon uh, Workers' Congress, which is a trade union slash political party that has not aligned itself with Tahoe parties uh, representing the Ceylon workers. Those people have some of the worst statistics for education, health, and the like. Uh, their working conditions are pretty bad, their living conditions are pretty bad. The whole set of conditions. I mean, we could take a whole campaign just about Tahoe workers, and they tend to be women uh, or young or children. Because the fingers are mm -hmm. You want to pick the blood and the twig. Uh, you know what men do that. Men do other things. So we could have a whole thing. There are some anthropologists who've done a lot of very interesting work in connection with that population uh, to try to do something. That's, that's a whole other, we could do a whole campaign just on that issue around fair trade tea, around, because that's the product they're producing, but they don't own the you know, plantation. They don't share the product. They get very low wages. So, Which kind of makes it not sound like fair trade tea. <laughs> <laughs> they, they went through a national, so if you're getting me off of Sorry. Right? No, no, no. I mean, I'll talk about Sri Lanka as long as anybody wants to listen to me. Uh, those, pop, those plantations were owned by British uh, expatriate British companies and Sri Lankan companies. And then they got nationalized by the government, the Sri Lankan government in the 70s. And then the nationalized companies didn't work so well. So then the late 70s and 80s, they began privatizing them all. So uh, privatizing them perhaps to people who might have been closed uh, So you have a bunch of private companies now running. Uh, and, but as far as what the workers saw, didn't, nothing really seemed to change. Yeah, my point was more that the government saying, we got it under control, that you guys don't need to worry about it. The world, this is our problem, we're handling it. And it's like nobody's really getting in and seeing what's going on over there except for some of the reports. And then once you do get the reports, then those people disappear. Um, and they're in like the problem. Yeah, they, we are slowly getting uh, foreign journalists in. The BBC's had, uh, they have a reporter, Charles Haplin, who's there. He's been able to get, he's mostly been based in Colombo. He's lately been able to get up to the north. But a lot of reporters, when they go up north, they will say, uh, you know, they get followed. The military is aware of where they're going, who they're talking to. So they have to be very careful about They don't want to endanger anybody. Here. So the word is getting out. I mean, the Killing Fields documentary shows you can get information out even when all the foreign media were all kept away from the actual war by having people leave the country and talk or having people come in and talk quietly to people, like when we interviewed Sandia. Uh, that was all done secretly, so we didn't want to get her targeted while we were interviewing her in Colombo, or not Colombo, she's outside Colombo. Uh, so gradually, we can try to get more information out. But you're right, there's a lot of, still a great risk that people providing human rights information. It's getting a little late, so um, if you guys want to stick around, you can ask some questions in your room if you have any more. Uh, Matt, get some more pizza. Anyway, we have plenty left over. If anyone didn't sign in, um, this is not for like us to like spam you or anything. It's just for because we got SBA funds, um, so they know who came to the event and people are actually here and and eating pizza. Um, so please try to sign in if you can. Um, other than that. Come on, sign the petitions if you had already, and thank you all for coming. We'll stick around for a little bit. Can I make an announcement? If you are interested in action, the DeKalb Interfaith Network for Peace and Justice, how many have seen us on the corners on Friday night? <laughs> make some good signs about uh, amnesty and plan to be there. And if you tell us in advance, we'll put in the paper that you're going to be there and that people are invited to come. Do you have an action chair in the local group? Uh, 
Yeah, I'm really sure. Yeah. It's whoever does it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I have a card I can leave with somebody. Yeah, you I'll all would contact us. We ought to work together. I don't think there's another. Do you call yourself a peace group? Maybe you don't. But there doesn't seem to be a peace group on campus at this point. We would like to work with some of the students. When Jesse Jackson was here, I was saying, here we are in the corner, we're all gray hairs. Where are the students? There's 23,000 of them there. And Jesse Jackson said, until we get the draft back, and that's true. When there was a draft, we had students, and they went downtown, and they broke some windows. <laughs> People listened. Who should I give this to? Another one. You have another one. I was going to ask you on um, either on their site or on Facebook or whatever. I easily printed out the petition for uh, mm -hmm. Pride, and I just didn't know if you wanted to maybe to see. We just had kind of do a blast and see anyone who wants to print mm -hmm. it out. It's so easy. If everyone just grabbed 12 signatures and mm -hmm. sent it in, it could just really yeah. cover mm -hmm. it. So they're real easy and they print out. Online. We also have a counter recruit recruitment table at the high school. You would be lawyers, it would be good to come to our table. <laughs> and we try to help the students from getting, getting sucked into another war. <laughs> All right. He explained why, why the Sinhalese are happy. Why, why the Sinhalese uh, are happy with the situation? It's because there's no more killing. And somebody said the situation is worse because there's more. What do you call this? Repression. And the Sinhalese, which side of the Sinhalese.